Welcome to Chatter. I'm David Priest, publisher of Lawfare. This week, author Kevin Bryant on spying in the NFL. You know, Mike Shanahan, when the Broncos played against the Packers in a in a Super Bowl, he actually got the services of 18 Navy SEALs to protect a hill that was overlooking the practice field that the Broncos were using for that game. You know, for international espionage, okay, espionage breaks the law. Breaking the laws of other countries is part of the game, right? Precisely, it's part of the game. And so, you know, football coaches, a lot of them would argue this is just part of the game and that's what it is. The NFL, they can stop pretty much all of this spying activity that they want through punishments if they make it severe enough. It's just a matter of, do they wanna make it severe enough for it to happen? Kevin Bryant, welcome to Chatter. Hey, David. Thanks so much for having me on. Appreciate it. And you're coming on at a really good time because NFL season is actually starting today. And I want to talk to you about that because you've done something really interesting, looking at the intersection of football, specifically the National Football League, and intelligence, both collection and analysis. And it has really opened my eyes that a whole lot of What looks like intelligence collection and analysis has been going on in some cases for decades, all building up to a particular game, right? It's intelligence collection within the game, but it's intelligence collection that goes back many years in terms of players and coaches and systems and all of this, including some nefarious clandestine collection and covert action. Let's let's start with getting the right personnel. If you're a football team, you're an NFL team. We know that teams scout heavily for the NFL draft and do a lot of research. That's that's not considered anything weird. But what about actual spying on prospects? Yeah, so absolutely. So like you said, David, teams want to know all about personnel. And typically when we think about that, we think about teams, you know, go into watch their practices and watch into watching games of prospects. And, you know, maybe talking to their coaches. Um, But I think that's probably about the extent of where most people think it really goes. Uh, But it's so much more in depth. So NFL teams that are investing a lot of um, of money um, and resources into these players really want to have a good idea of who they are as a person as well. So what they're going to do is get down into the weeds of, are there any potential legal issues or behavioral problems, drinking, drugs, you know, any problems that relate to anything like that, these teams want to know about, especially the higher a prospect is picked, the more a team is going to examine that prospect. That makes sense, right? Um, I mean, it's, it's a huge investment for a team. You're talking could be hundreds of millions of dollars, depending on how the contract works out. Um, So it's not surprising they're going to do research and background checks and all that. But kind of for you, where does that start to cross the line and feel a little bit creepy in terms of more intrusive investigation than than you would expect? Right. So I'd say in two matters. So one is the team, the coaches and scouts are going to do all their homework. But after that, it really gets turned over to typically the head of a team's security. And that individual is typically a for, had worked in law enforcement, very often a former FBI agent. And so that person is going to have ties to the law enforcement community. So say, for example, you're investigating, you're looking into a prospect and you want to see if he's had any potential criminal um, involvement in the past, right? And he's a, let's say, a 20-year-old kid. So any, or 21 year old kids, somewhere around there, 20 to 22, probably coming out of college. So, you know, there's a very good chance it happened before this prospect turned 18. And to be able to get that type of information where the records could be protected, right, it gets very tricky. So it really helps to have a former FBI official who can go down and talk to a local police department and say, hey, I know, you know, this this, you know, this record, I can't access this record. It's protected information, but just between you and I, you know, 
<laughs> you know, are there any issues here that I need to be aware of? I'd imagine, so that is- I'd imagine an NFL coach going and doing that. Most local law enforcement, unless they're in that city and a fan, most local law enforcement would say, you know, go screw yourself. You know, that's that's not what we yeah. do. But if it's somebody who's built up a relationship over a career with with some of these people, yeah, it's okay. You know, we can help you out with something. It's it's maybe it's not illegal. It's just not, not something we'd normally do, but they cross a line doing that. Right. Yeah, that's it exactly. And so I would say the second area that gets, you know, a little shady mm-hmm. uh, is that teams will actually at, at times hire surveillance to go out and to follow these prospects around and to learn what they're doing. So that could either be, it could be a member of the, the staff of a team staff that does that. Um, that's been known to happen, especially at bars, you know, to have a guy sit down at, at a prospect's favorite drinking establishment right? and just see how often does he go there? How much does the individual drink yep. to get a good idea for that? Or to actually hire a private security company mm-hmm. that does formal surveillance to go out and follow this person around to see who are they meeting with? What type of characters is he hanging out with? Mm-hmm. Especially if you're worried about, you know, drug issues or gang issues. Um, you know, maybe follow a person around on an airplane. Um, see, see where they're going, see how they behave, see how they treat other people. Because especially, you know, this goes beyond just the draft. This is with free agents as well. So let's say you're looking at taking a guy like Deshaun Watson, mm. right? Yeah. Who you're worried about his past and his history and his and character issues. That would be a very good type of person to have this, you know, have a security team, have a surveillance team, follow this guy around and see potentially um, what it, what is the reality of the situation? Absolutely. Is this a concern? There's a, I'm old enough to remember uh, a highly regarded wide receiver. Um, it was about 10 years ago, Justin Blackman, right? And uh, he, he was a good receiver, right? He had the skills, but I, I think this is one of the cases where you had some people go and essentially stalk him, right? To find out whether his personal behavior was on the up and up. What did they find? Yeah, so ultimately the Jacksonville Jaguars, um, if I remember right, ended up taking Justin Blackman. But um, yeah, there. I mean, he was a very, very highly regarded prospect coming out of college. The problem he had um, was some teams believed he had a alcohol issue. And so there were a number of teams that ended up um, passing on him beyond what his skill set, you know, the skill set said he should have been drafted earlier. Um, and ultimately Jacksonville ended up picking him up and his, his career was cut short um, because of substance abuse issues. And he really never got up and going. I, I don't not even sure he played a full season's worth of games. I don't think, I don't think he did, but did, Jacksonville didn't figure that out. Did some other teams figure that out so that Jacksonville got stuck with him instead of them getting stuck with him. Yeah, they did, David. And to be frank, I don't remember the team that ended up, you know, I know there was a team that identified this issue, ended up passing on him. um, And actually they did their research, huh? Right. They did. That's exactly it. They did the research and and figured this out. Um, And that's very common, you know, and it is always a very difficult situation when you get guys like this, because, you know, frankly, um, there, you know, the NFL has a bit of an issue. Uh, you know, football is a violent game mm-hmm. and you get a lot of violent yeah. people coming in and playing football. Right. So it's, it's it, at times very difficult for NFL teams to know where exactly are you willing to cross that line? How far are we willing to accept imperfections in a person's character? before uh, we just say, you know, uh, this is, it, it's too risky. Uh, to fit. And that's different for different teams. That all makes sense. I mean, y- the investments are huge. Um, the, the cost of getting something wrong. I mean, I live near Washington, D.C., and we've gotten things wrong in the draft as long as I can remember. Um, mm-hmm. Then that <laughs> actually hurts the franchise for a long period of time. So, yes, Getting the right players matter. And part of, part of that is researching people that probably won't work out and trying to figure that out before you select them. 
But part of that is also something that overlaps with intelligence issues as well, which is denial and deception. And I'd like you to talk just a little bit about how how teams deliberately spend some resources showing an interest in someone, traveling uh, there, putting ideas out that they're really interested in somebody just to throw other teams off who they're really interested in. How does that work? Yeah, so, you know, teams are, they never want to let their opponents know who they're interested in. Um, And for the most part, um, you know, at the top of the draft, it can become pretty obvious, especially if a team has a, you know, a need at the quarterback position or another key position like that. Um, But for the most part, teams try to hold their draft cards very close to them um, because you can really get some, some, um, there can be a lot of advantages to doing that. So all the teams, they assess players differently. So, you know, to give you an example, Joe Montana, right, who's considered one of the great quarterbacks of all times. Right. You know, the 49ers had identified Joe Montana as someone that they wanted to draft. And, um, you know, they, they looked at him and said, you know what, we're willing to draft Joe Montana earlier. And I believe he went in the third round Hmm. and we're willing to draft him earlier, but we don't see any other team that's going to take him earlier than our pick in the third. Hmm. And so, you know, what the 49ers ended up doing was actually trading. I believe they took their third round pick and actually moved back in the draft to take another player with that earlier position and still managed to grab Joe Montana um, because teams in the draft, they want to take players as late as they possibly can to get the most bang for their bucks. You know, it's really the equivalent of, for us, you know, why would you want to buy a, a roll of paper towels for $4 if you could buy one, the same thing for $2, right? And so this is essentially what teams in the draft are trying to do. So, Teams are not only assessing prospects as they go about the offseason, but they are assessing how do their opponents assess those same draft prospects. So when scouts are out on the road, they're collecting information on the assessments of their fellow of the fellow scouts that are out there, um, you know, touring with them. Which ironically which, is which a is resource really you're not devoting to your own assessments, right? You're, you're, some of your resources are being devoted to that, which means you're not putting as much into your own. And that's got to be a tough balance to figure out. How much am I throwing other people off? How much am I collecting intelligence on what they're doing to try to assess my own versus how much am I actually just doing a straight up ranking of who I want when, regardless of what other people are doing? That's hard. Yeah, absolutely. It, it is. It's very tough. And so, um, you know, the interesting thing I think is under Al Davis, they had a scout named Ron Wolf, who was a former um, intelligence operative, and he he worked back in the in the Cold War, and you know in Berlin, um, in, in the uh, you know in in the, in the midst of the Cold War, and he was really renowned for not just his assessment of prospects, which was really good, but his assessments of how other teams viewed prospects was even better. And so being a former Intel guy, what he was able to do was to sit in the draft room and be able to tell the coaches, the Steelers aren't going to draft this guy right here. Mm -hmm. I know it because I talked to this scout. He said this. These are their team needs. And furthermore, this is the intelligence that I know that the Steelers know about other teams or about us, about how we view them or how other teams view them. And he really was looking at all of this through an intelligence lens, like an analyst would, of assessing this. And he did a magnificent job of that for Al Davis and the Raiders. And that's before you had the network TV analysts, you know, the experts in predicting the draft mm-hmm. board, which essentially evens the field, right? Because there's somebody who presumably is a neutral judge. Uh, that is, they're not paid by any one team to put false information out there. That would be one hell of a scandal. Um, so that information is out there, but that's that's one person's assessment and often a very good assessment, but that's not the same as a team doing it themselves and trying to uncover what teams would not reveal to a reporter or an analyst. Right. So that gets, you know, when you're talking about the world of journalists, that gets really interesting because yeah. teams 
are absolutely very concerned with what the information they share with journalists. So one, because a journalist's job is to report information that is of interest to the general population, right? And so getting a scoop on who might be the first round pick of a team, that's a big story. So obviously a team's going to be concerned there. But um, on the other hand, you've got concerns about the media because uh, journalists are essentially trained, trained spies working for newspapers in a sense, right? They know how to work with people and, the, and how to get information and how to work with anonymous sources and how to manipulate people to be able to get information, things that spies are trained to do. And so furthermore, where does a journalist's allegiance lie? That, become, that can become a very tough question. Um, and so for local teams dealing with local press, generally, you know, those coaches will have a certain amount of trust with local media members to give them a bit of information beyond what they're willing to share with most because they're like, well, if we're the Broncos and you're a press member from Denver, we're going to assume you're a Denver fan and you're going to protect our information if you want to share a bit. But if it's say a reporter from USA Today, the New York Times, where it's okay, a, a nationwide audience there, can you trust that person? And furthermore, do you absolutely know that that media member is not going to be reporting back information to another team sure. who he might be a fan of or might <laughs> even be getting a paycheck under the table from, right? <laughs> and all that's going, game. well, that sounds ridiculous. Right. But, uh, you know, read spies on the sidelines and uh, yeah. it, it might hit home a little, a little more because um, those are those are valid fears and that type of stuff absolutely takes place, has taken place in the NFL and will continue to take place in the NFL. Yeah, I will highlight uh, the book you just mentioned, your new book, Spies on the Sidelines, The High Stakes World of NFL Espionage, which has a lot of these stories in it. And I was just blown away by one that I had not heard before. And it's it's old school, right? You're bringing cases uh, and, and examples from decades ago, as well as just within the last few years. But you mentioned that uh, the Colts were really interested in finding out who the Browns were interested in drafting in, uh, I believe, 1953. And so what did they do? They went after and recruited... <laughs> The, uh, the Browns assistant coach, Weeb Eubank, and they hired him as their head coach and were trying to basically get the targets for the 1953 draft. That's that's cold blooded. You actually steal the staff that's been working on the draft in order to find out what the team was doing. You're essentially turning the employee against their former employer. Yeah, that was a really interesting case. So, you know, the the Browns back then were coached by Paul Brown who the Cleveland Browns are named after. He is a very famous coach who's regarded by many coaches to be the greatest coach in the history of the NFL. And at that time, the Cleveland Browns were knocking drafts out of the park, uh, frankly, because they did a much better job of assessing prospects than anybody else. They actually went and scouted, whereas a lot of teams were relying on magazines or just word of mouth uh, to assess prospects. So um, everybody wanted to know who the Cleveland Browns were drafting because they were so successful. So um, the Colts uh, went after Weeb Eubank, uh, who was a very good coach in his own right and went on to a great deal of success. Um, but when the, the Colts hired Weeb Eubank, Paul Brown went to the NFL commissioner and he said, hey, commish, I've got an issue. Weeb Eubank was responsible for putting together our entire draft plan for the Browns. So what I'm asking you is, can I keep Weeb Eubank on my staff until the draft is over? And at that point, I'll let him loose and he can go to the Colts and become their head coach. Hmm. And the commissioner at the time agreed to this and said, yeah, sure, that makes sense. Okay. Uh, the problem was, allegedly, okay, <laughs> um, and, and Paul Brown wrote about this. And that Weeb Eubank was providing information to the Colts via a journalist um, during the draft. Oh. And so for most of the draft, the Colts picked 
uh, just one or two picks ahead of the Browns, and they were snatching up the Browns' <laughs> target almost every single round. Um, and then Paul Brown eventually he said, "Well, how is this going? I don't see Weeb Eubank meeting with any of the Colts players. I suspect it's him, given that the Colts are constantly picking him, but." I don't have the proof. Mm-hmm. And then he saw the journalist come over to the table and put two and two together wow. and had that conversation with Weeb and basically said, wow. Hey Weeb, thanks for your service, but I don't need you anymore. Right. Yeah, just cut him loose at that point. Right. Wow. And so, you know, I think there's a great incident of one, mm-hmm. you got to be concerned about journalists yeah. and two, you've got to be concerned about even people inside your own organization providing information to other teams. And that's a very real concern in the NFL and not just from people that are leaving your organization, like, like in that incident instance. Well, what that does is it kind of takes the story from just pure intelligence collection to an issue of uh, an issue of counterintelligence. So NFL, NFL teams are doing things that intelligence organizations do to protect information like compartmentation. You restrict how many people in the organization know mm-hmm. the draft prospects in the draft order. And in some cases, very few people know, only the senior most executives and maybe the head coach, maybe not even the assistant coaches, because you know every year the coaching carousel, so many of those assistant coaches go to rivals. Um, right. And then there's actual physical security, right? That the draft boards are locked up, sometimes with multiple locks. Um, it's almost like you're putting a skiff around <laughs> The draft board, and I'm betting that some NFL teams right. at this point that their security does rival what is usually protecting classified information in the national security realm. Yeah, that's absolutely right, David. So, I mean, I think one of the things you see is those those teams that are winning, um, and there's a lot of examples for this in in spies on the sidelines. The teams that are winning are doing a really good job yeah. of collecting information and protecting uh, their information. Yeah. And the teams that aren't, aren't. <laughs> and, and so, yeah, you absolutely have teams that are, do a great job of securing their information more than others. And that can be, you know, defending who they're going after in the draft. Yeah. That can be protecting their signals information. So, for example, um, you know, today coaches are calling the plays by and large via headsets, mm. right? But there is also... Um, the use of of signals still uh, that get put out. Let's say a quarterback wants to change the play at the line of scrimmage. Well, he's going to use probably a spoken audible so his linemen can hear him. But especially if they're playing away, he needs to send a hand signal out to those wide receivers sure. so that they can hear sure. out on the on the fringes of the, the field. And so teams are absolutely concerned with collecting those signals and audibles that other teams are calling and trying to match them up with the upcoming play. Now, teams that are smart are going to be changing those signals over the course of time so that you can't change it all at once. Okay, if you do, your team's just going to forget. It's too much to memorize for them all at once. You know, if you try to change your signals, all of your signals between week two and week three, Okay, you'll have a bunch of players that don't know what they're doing because they can't remember everything. That's right. Right? Yeah. But if you change four or five signals a game, you can gradually change them over the course of time. Mm -hmm. And then what that allows you to do is when a coach, an opposing coach, sees that some of the changes, some of the signals have changed, Mm -hmm. then he goes, oh, can I trust? Even if I think I still know these, I am no longer certain that it hasn't changed, Mm -hmm. okay? Which is great. And furthermore, really smart coaches will start taking steps to deceive the opponent. Right. Meaning, okay, if between week two and week three, especially if you have a member of the opposing team who was recently a member of your team, who was cut, or who was picked up off your practice squad, right? Another spy situation, right? Right. You may go, you know what? We know Joe over there, who just went over to the Panthers, knows all about our offensive plays here with the Colts. So what we're going to do on the second or third play of the game, or the fir- maybe the first time we get in a third and short situation, mm-hmm. okay, is we're going to call what appears to be a run play, which is going to be a, a play action pass. We're going to fake hand in the ball off 
to the running back. Quarterback's going to keep it. Shield the ball for a few seconds. And then look at that wide receiver who is streaking down the middle of the field 30 yards beyond the line of scrimmage. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, what they're hoping is that Joe is going to call out to the defense and say, hey, it's a run play. Mm -hmm. Because especially if the quarterback audibles that call at the line of scrimmage, and Joe overhears it and says, oh, I know exactly what they're going to do. And he tells the defense through however he wants to tell them, yeah. probably a coded message. It's a run. It's a run. All right. And then the whole the safeties come up to defend against this run because they're certain it's going to be a run. Yeah. But they just get suckered in. Mm -hmm. And that type of, you know, counterintelligence yeah. activity is absolutely going on in the NFL on a weekly basis. And I'm guessing, based on the way you've told that story, that there's there's nothing in league rules banning that. That is, you can get players from other teams, sign them, maybe just put them on the practice squad, but they know some of the signals and they know some of the audibles, or maybe they are actual starters and you put them out there. And I think, you know, looking during a game, trying to watch the signals or trying to listen to the audibles during the game and adjusting in real time, I think is allowed. But the league does forbid certain things, right? Like, do I have it right that you can't videotape another team signals during a game and analyze that during the game? That is correct. David. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So some things are out of bounds. And I think we'll, we'll get to a story later where it kind of doesn't matter because <laughs> some teams cheat anyway when it comes sure. to that. But yeah. It embraces an interesting point, which is that there are there are boundaries of ethics. Maybe it's wrong to get a player, sign him just to steal signals, and then cut the player. That that just feels wrong, but it is part of the game, and the league rules allow it. Maybe it's okay to do false audibles and do play action. That's just part of the game, right? You expect Peyton Manning. Well, you expected play Peyton Manning when he played to be right. up there screaming Omaha, Omaha all the time mm -hmm. and to have teams wondering, okay, is that the signal or is that a tell for another signal? Um, how much is he messing with us? Because he likes to do that. But there are lines that can be crossed that get you into more trouble. And I'm fascinated by this because of the background you bring to this, right? I mean, you have an interesting mix of angles to bring to this. You, you did spend, what, 20 some years safeguarding and gathering information for the Department of Defense, and you have a master's in intelligence studies, but you also have a master's degree in sports management, and you've done a hell of a lot of research on the history of the NFL. How did you get information for this book and get people to talk about what so often they refuse to divulge even at the end of a career because it just feels too secret? Yeah, so... Um... It was it was really difficult um, acquiring the information. First of all, so you know, no one had ever written a book on this subject um, about you know how how teams gather information on their opponents, trying amazing. to get a game day advantage. Okay, mm -hmm. Brian O'Leary um, had written a book called Spygate, which is a great book about the Patriots and just about the Spygate incident mm -hmm. that took place. Um, but no one had ever covered the whole history of the NFL and no one had ever written a book about it that covered all of the NFL's teams. So that was my goal going forward in this book. Um, so, I, you know, I got really incident, really interested in the subject after Spygate 2 happened, which was when the Patriots offensive coordinator, Josh McDaniels, mm -hmm. who is now the head coach of the Raiders, mm -hmm. he moved over from the Patriots to become the head coach of the Broncos. And he brought with him a videographer that used to work with the Patriots mm. underneath um, during the Spygate era, which, of course, you know, that's, that's really strange to bring along a videographer with you from a team, right? And this videographer got in trouble for recording another team's practice. Um, and then Josh McDaniels didn't report the incident. The Broncos management ultimately found out about it, self-reported to the NFL, and then Everybody got in trouble. The videographer, Josh McDaniels, the Broncos. But being a Broncos fan, at that point, I got very interested in, you know, I really wonder how much of this stuff goes on in the NFL, you know, given, given my background. Mm -hmm. And 
And so I decided to look into it. And so, you know, I started with just with the internet. Let me see what I can find out there that's available. And there was a, quite a bit, but it spread all throughout. Right. No one's ever been able Bits to and pieces here and there. consolidate it. Right. Yeah. Um, so I started with that, realized that there was a good chunk of information out there, found out no one had ever written a book and decided I would wanted to write a book for a long time and said, you know what, given my background and given my degrees, I'm going to try to do this. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I started by reading a bunch of uh, books that former coaches had read because I figured, you know what, if I'm going to find it, it's probably in these things. And some of those coaches in, in memoirs essentially ad admitted to some quite shocking yeah. things. And sometimes it's just one story that a coach tells. But if you triangulate with other information, you're, you're able to find out what happened in a way that many fans had never heard before, except for that one little tidbit that dropped. Uh, so to me, it's fun to see these characters, the legendary ones from you know George Hallis and, and Vince Lombardi, all the way up to some current coaches in the NFL and how they do have a long history <laughs> of these stories that maybe they've told themselves or maybe other people have told about them at earlier points in their career, but nobody had pulled that together before. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, whenever you're dealing with coaches, it's really hard to get that information, the current information, right? Mm -hmm. Because if a coach goes and talks about what he's doing now, especially if it breaks NFL laws, mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't say laws, NFL rules yeah. or bylaws, you know, that can, that can get the team in trouble. I can get the coach in trouble. It can taint legacies. Even if he's talking about another team, you know, teams are, coaches are very reluctant to rat out mm -hmm. even another coach on a team that's doing this type of stuff. Yeah. Uh, one, because it's how they all earn their living, one. And then two, so many coaches are, you know, um, involved in things that maybe, if not breaking rules, at least questionable, you know, whether is this ethical, is it not? Right. Um, and so a lot of times coaches, even when they catch another team spying, they won't turn in that member of the team they find spying. Hmm. I mean, there's numerous examples in, in spies in the sidelines of where a person gets caught and then the coach just goes, ah, get out of here now. Yeah. You know, um, I think there's a, you know, there's a really good example where, um, Maury Schleicher from the Raiders um, gets caught. And I'm trying to remember what coach caught him. Hmm. Um, I want to say it was Weeb Eubank with the Jets. Hmm. But um, Schleicher was actually, he was on the other team's bus. And while they were going from the practice field to the team hotel, <laughs> you know, right before, you know, at the practice, right before the two teams played it's each other. It's a gutsy move to actually get right. on the other team bus and like put a towel over your head and hope nobody notices. You know, and I imagine what he was trying to do was simply, he probably watched the practice beforehand mm -hmm. and he said, you know what, maybe I can even get on the bus <laughs> and learn a few tidbits, overhear some conversations yeah. that'll get me even more information. And so he tries this daring, you know, thing and the coach just kicks him off the bus, you know, mm -hmm. which I, I found amazing because you got a, you know, you got a bus full of, you know, 200 to 300 pound football players. And, you know, I'm like, oh man, this guy's going to get his butt kicked. Right. right. Um, but the coach just lets him off and nothing ever happens because of it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and you say, well, why didn't, why didn't he turn him in? Well, if you read the book and see all the things that Weeb Eubank was up to, including the story of when he turned over, you know, allegedly turned over draft picks to the, you know, to the Colts. Yeah. You'll understand that if you live in glass houses, you don't want to be the one throwing rocks. That's right. And so, That's yeah. Right. You eliminate the immediate problem, but you you don't want to get rid of the practice of spying on each other. It's almost parallel to, you know, the US and the Soviet Union and then Russia now doing spy swaps, right? You, you call mm -hmm. one of my spies. Well, guess what? We know who yours are. We're going to catch one and we're going to do a spy swap and, you know, basically reset when it comes to that level of espionage. It's kind of similar there in right. the NFL that everybody knows it happens. And we'll talk a little bit later about the, the team that has been accused the most and been caught, I think, most recently the most. Mm -hmm. um, and whether there's an effect there just because they're in the spotlight so much. But I found it really interesting to, to read your stories about the whole range of things, some of which I hadn't really thought about specifically, like right before games, 
the fact that you can have people watching practices, which is generally fine with, with some restrictions, but you just mentioned something about videotaping practices being a problem. Uh, what are the limits in the NFL now on who can attend practices, under what conditions people are allowed to visit other teams' practices? How does that work? Yeah, so that gets complex. You know, so if you're talking about watching another ch- team's training camp practices, yeah. which are probably the easiest practices to watch, because once the season really gets into the swing of things, then they're closed. Practices are closed, the right? Training camp, the fans are coming to show up. It's a chance to right. build loyalty for your team and m- maybe get some other uh, spies in there. So how does that? How is that regulated? Yeah. yeah. So you got fans sometimes showing up by the tens of thousands watching these things. So the NFL has a rule in place that as long as a team does not charge money for preseason practices, that scouts from other team cannot go and watch these games Hmm. or watch these practices. Okay. Having said that, of course, you would be a fool to believe that teams still aren't sending, you know, scouts and assistant coaches to go watch some of this stuff. Um, Hmm. Now, I remember a few years ago. The Washington Commanders, as they're known now, Mm -hmm. um, that Dan Snyder, the owner, was was trying to make more money as as he does, and he was charging for people to go into practices. Now, it sounds like if I heard you right, if if you make your practices free in training camp, then you can't use those as collection opportunities, uh, even though people might do it. But once you charge people to come in the door, basically the gloves are off, people can pay and then be there to spy. And that's not against league rules. Right. That is absolutely correct. So yeah. So in that example, when Dan Snyder decided, you know what, I bet we can soak a little extra money out of our fan base by charging for these practices. And he was right. It worked great. Everybody still was still showing up and you know, but. in droves, but the problem became uh, all these all all these opposing teams were also sending members of their coaching staff to go watch the Redskins, right. and um, Snyder and the Redskins very quickly yeah. ended that practice once they figured out what was going on. Right. You've also looked at other means by which teams spy on each other's practices, and often this would be practices during the regular season, even in the playoffs, um, and how physical access really matters here. Things like Mm -hmm. geography, things like hills nearby that with binoculars or a telescope or hotels. Talk through some of those stories and some of the means that both teams use to spy on each other, but that teams uh, have security officers trying to prevent that. Right. So absolutely. So, you know, the closer that a spy can get to the action, the better off they're going to be, right? Because they want to be able to see Um, up close and personal what's going on, and ideally be able to hear the instructions that coaches are providing. The problem obviously becomes uh, the closer you are to the action, the more likely you are to get caught. Teams have posted spies as close as in the bushes, next to practice fields, um, up in the scoreboards. You know, you're talking about maybe potentially using a car that, you know, has a view Park in your car if, if it has a view of the practice field that's being used. Of course, if you're talking about in a stadium now, it's getting really tricky. So how do you how do you watch what's going on if there is a big stadium or just walls, you know, or fences with tarp around them to be able to see? So you need vantage points that are elevated. And so here you're talking about hills, which become a big concern. You know, Mike Shanahan, when uh the Broncos played against the Packers in a in a Super Bowl. He actually got the services of 18 Navy SEALs to protect <laughs> a field that uh, uh, protect a hill that was overlooking the practice field that the Broncos were using for that game. And you know, and funny enough, uh, the the Broncos former owner Pat Bolin, mm-hmm. um, you know, he recounts a great episode where um, you know there was an air. A helicopter flying overhead, and you know, and Mike Shanahan turned to these uh, Navy SEALs and just looked at them like, "Hey, what are you going to do about it? You know, why aren't you firing a you know a surface to air missile and knocking these dudes out of the sky? You know, and it was it was just a news helicopter, you know, trying to yeah. trying to see what was going on and get a story. Um, 
that's how paranoid the coaches become. And so another, um, besides Hills, you're looking at hotel rooms, mm -hmm. which is obviously absolutely a big concern of teams because, you know, high rise buildings are a great spot to be able to spy on a team's practice, but how do you get access to them? Mm -hmm. But with a hotel, mm -hmm. all you got to get is a hotel room that's, you know, on the right side and high enough up to get a view. So that's absolutely a concern. We know that teams have used it in the past. And so teams take action like renting out all of the hotel rooms um, that face the field, right. you know, that are above, above the vantage point where they can be seen at. Um, they also make friends of a hotel staff. Mm. So especially with staff security. Mm -hmm. So that if someone comes into that hotel and says, hey, is it possible for me to get a room that overlooks the field right. or that is on the east side mm -hmm. of your hotel room, that that em hotel employee calls up the team security and says, hey, eh, we got a weird request here. You may want to check it out. Sure. And then a security member of the team does just that to figure out, okay, is this potentially a spy from, from a, you know, an upcoming opponent that's coming to see trying to uh, learn a little bit about what we're, what we're up to. Right on. And a lot of home practice facilities now, right? You can do, you can do the bubble, right? You can blow up, put a dome uh, over the field to protect it. But when you're traveling, that's a little bit hard to do. And certainly back, you know, 50 years ago, you didn't have that as much. I, I remember the stories and maybe these are apocryphal, but I, you know, I was born in Illinois and the Chicago Bears are everything. And you hear about the evil of the Packers and all the bad things that <laughs> Vince Lombardi yeah. did. And I'm sure that they heard all the stories about all the bad things that George Hallis did. But I remember hearing stories that that George Hallis, uh, legendary um, leader of the Bears, that he famously held secret practices, that there were practices that were known, but then he would go off and either in the middle of the night or in places that were unusual, that's where the real practices would happen. And that's where they do the plays <laughs> that they didn't want anybody to see because they couldn't be sure that somebody wasn't spying on them. Right. Yeah. So that used to be, yeah, you know, uh, Packer Panic Week. Um, absolutely. So, you know, and George Hallis did that, but, you know, that goes up. Heck, Peyton Manning did the same thing with the Broncos. So, you know, the great, the great quarterbacks are as much a coach as the coaches. Sure. Okay. And so when Manning was with the Broncos and they were um, going to be playing the Patriots uh, for a, an away game, right? He probably he, had pretty good reason to be wary of traveling, uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> traveling to, uh, to New England. Yeah. Yeah. What did he do? So what he did was he, he talked the coaches into stopping the bus on the way to the stadium and holding a practice in the middle of the woods. <laughs> a walkthrough practice. Uh, but he said, you know what? They're going to watch us at the stadium. If we, if we go do a walkthrough practice there, there'll be somebody up in the stands uh, there watching. So, um, yeah, he pulled, he literally took the team through a, a hike through the woods. The team, nobody knew what was going on other than a few of the coaches. It was so secretive that, that they didn't even want to, you know, let team members know because out of the fear that, you know, someone would let something slip to a family member and then it gets back. no. I mean, these guys are like, what are we doing? That's brilliant. Brings them out in the middle of the woods and, and they, they go through it there. Um, other coaches have done practices in the middle of the night mm -hmm. or brought the team to a completely different facility than where they normally train at. And, you know, this type of stuff, especially if you don't have a field that you can protect, you know, I consider an indoor facility that is, you know, the equivalent of a, you know, a you know, a, a death star system, you know, it's your ultimate protection. Yeah. Okay. Um, but for teams that don't have that, especially if they're in a big city where you're concerned about all those high rise buildings and locations, sometimes you got to get pretty creative or when you absolutely, when you're on the road yeah. and you, you're, you're worried because where can you go? You can go to a high school facility or maybe a junior college facility in practice, right. but those aren't really closed off. That's true. Or you can go to the other team's facilities or stadium, but then you're worried, you know what, we know who really controls these places. Right. And so you don't have the security that you wish you had. But that opens up opportunities then, right? Because all the cases we've talked about so far with these practices are denial. You're denying intelligence collection by, you know, Peyton Manning running off in the middle of the forest to do walkthroughs, or you're trying to hold the practice in the middle of the night 
thinking people won't be able to watch or you're keeping people from renting on that side of a, a rental facility or um, mm-hmm. using that room for the night. But there are also cases of deception, right? That in practices, sure, go ahead and go to, if you're a visiting team, go ahead and practice on the home team's field. Assume you're going to be watched, but throw in some plays you're not going to use. And don't use the third and short or the red zone plays that you really want to pull out. Maybe you practice those at home, but you deliberately don't practice them to try to throw off the other team. I assume that happens all the time. Absolutely. So you, you've got stuff from teams not being willing to even practice plays before a Super Bowl. Um, the Eagles did this before they played the Patriots in, in a you know, fairly recent Super Bowl. Um, and they had a play that they were designed to run down on the goal line um, that they were pretty sure would result in a touchdown. Um, but, the, you know, Eagles coach was so paranoid about the Patriots spying in, on, the, on their practices and learning of this play that he never actually practiced the play. He just simply said, you know what, we're going to talk about it in, in, you know, inside of our, um, you know, inside of the locker room or inside of our meeting rooms. That's fine. But we are never going to actually practice this play on the field. And it worked. Um, it, it got them a touchdown and, um, I believe it was called the Philly special. Um, so that type of stuff happens also, you know, it's, there are other measures that teams employ that, you know, when you, when you believe you're being spied upon, or at least you have reason to, um, you know, let's say you're taking the playing the Patriots. Okay. And you're like, well, this is a team that has a history Mm -hmm. of a bunch of underhanded techniques that we know we can't trust them. And we're worried about it. So what teams do sometimes is have players switch jerseys. Uh So for example, you got a star player that you want, you know, the other team may be very interested in how you're going to use that Mm -hmm. star player, Mm -hmm. right? Especially a wide receiver or running back potentially. Um, yeah, have them switch, switch jerseys so that if they are watching from afar, right through binoculars or whatever means, okay, that maybe they're not going to notice that you switch these jerseys and hopefully you're going to be watching the wrong guy do his thing. Another technique that is used is putting a 12th or even a 13th player on the field. So what does it mean if you now have, you know, uh, an extra player in there who you're probably going to put him in as an extra wide receiver. Okay. And you're trying to learn the routes that these guys are running for a certain play. Well, what, which of these guys that's in there right. is the dummy wide receiver and who's legit. And <laughs> you, you, you know, hopefully the other team can't figure it out. Yeah. And so, you know, the problem with all of these is this is great, but you can end up, it takes some time out of your, you know, your own practices. It can confuse your own players mm-hmm. as to what's going on. And obviously you have to plan for that. And there's only so much time in a week to plan for what is happening. And coaches have their schedules planned out to the nth degree. Mm-hmm. There is no free time. So when you're playing versus a team that has a history of conducting these types of nefarious activities, it's really a challenge for the coaching staff to deal with it because um, they, they have to plan for it, but it's taken time away from something else that needs to be tended to. Now, is it assumed, and, and maybe I'm, I'm wrong here, but is it just assumed in most teams that when you travel and you're using the, the visiting team's locker room, um, and not just at Foxborough, but anywhere in the league, is it mm-hmm. assumed that, you know, the walls are listening that, you know, maybe it's the, the staff of the facility that are walking by the door, or maybe it's actual listening devices planted in there. Do, do most teams take care not to actually talk about a lot of details in the locker room out of fear of that and use code words and things, or at halftime, do you basically have to talk about it because you have no other choice and you run the risk? that in fact, the team is collecting on you. Right. So teams deal with that in a variety of ways. Of course, you know, in the modern era, uh, we're lucky enough that there's, you know, TSCM companies, technical surveillance countermeasure, you know, companies that can come in and do 
uh, sweeps for listening devices or hidden video cameras. Okay. Um, so teams do employ those types of services. Mike Shanahan with the Broncos is known. He said, yeah, I did this with a number of teams that I was worried about. Um, and he said, oddly enough, the Patriots weren't even one of those. So that is a fear from NFL coaches. Um, some coaches have been absolutely certain that this has gone on in the past. Um, you know, there's a, a good story and spies on the sidelines of, uh, you know, with one coach, you know, shaking his fist at the ceiling and saying, you know, damn you, Al Davis, I know you're up there. You're talking about Al Davis, the Raiders owner for so right. many years, who's perhaps infamous, maybe matched only by uh, Belichick in terms of his ability to uh, push these boundaries. Yes. So absolutely. When you're dealing with coaches that have that type of reputation, um, teams are going to take those extra steps. You know, when Peyton Manning played against the Patriots, he revealed that um, he, last year, whenever he would travel to Gillette Stadium, he would drag his wide receivers into the shower room and, you know, I would imagine turn on the running water yeah. so that he could have conversations in there um, without worry, being worried about being overheard by, you know, the Patriots using a listening device. Um, he was also, he said, you know, there's a, a another news article I ran into um, that said he used to, he refused to talk about most things in the locker room. He would actually drag coaches um, outside of the locker room before he was willing to talk about anything. Mm -hmm. And other coaches have, you know, they've, they have either been unwilling to discuss strategy in the locker room mm -hmm. or they have provided false information right. during their locker room speeches yeah. to try to deceive uh, an opponent that just might be listening in and doing all that. And so it's one of those subjects. No one's really quite sure. Has it been used? How frequently is it used? Um, it, a listening device is known to have been used in college football before. A coach has admitted to another coach, hey, I used a listening device. I heard everything that you said, um, and you guys still managed to beat me. I don't know how you did it, but congratulations. So, you know, once it's known to be used, it becomes a legitimate fear. Mm -hmm. And, of course, as small and as hard to detect as those things are today, um, coaches have every reason to be paranoid about them being used, and, and rightfully so. And it sounds like it's maybe uncomfortable, but it's generally accepted that there is some risk and you take steps to mitigate that risk. Are there some areas that are off limits? Because I'm thinking here about, you know, the weekly injury reports. And if I'm a head coach and I'm trying to throw the other team off, um, you know, maybe there is a minor injury to one of my star players. And I just kind of fudge it a little bit and say that they're severely injured and they're unlikely to play. And then suddenly I pull them out at the last minute because they had a miraculous recovery or vice versa, which is that somebody is dramatically injured and you know a whole lot of the play planning is going to be focused on this key player and you minimize the injury so the team has to expect that person to be there. Are there any league rules against outright lying about injuries? Yeah, so the NFL requires uh, teams to report on the the status of their players and um, and basically break down the level of injury they have. Mm -hmm. And um, but you know that's very dis um, that's a big disadvantage for for these teams mm -hmm. um, because one, it's revealing information um, about who may be available or not available for a game. And then revealing the extent of an injury and where an injury is. Okay. So for example, if you've got a quarterback that has an injured right shoulder, okay, man, that's, that's something another team's going to want to know, right? Yeah. You're going to hit it over and over again. You're going to try to you pound that guy in the shoulder time after time. Yeah. So absolutely. Coaches have been known to do things like say, you know what? He's got an injured left shoulder. It just, switch where the injury is. It's on, it's on another side mm -hmm. or to say, you know, um, it's, it's a very slight injury yeah. when it's a pretty severe injury, mm -hmm. or of course, to exaggerate the extent of the injury, um, to be able to say, Hey, our key player, it looks like our key player. It looks like he's going to be out for the game. Mm -hmm. 
which if teams don't game plan, especially for a star player, that can be devastating. Mm -hmm. Absolutely devastating to them because, you know, if you don't account for, let's say, like a Lawrence Taylor, okay, in a game, right, and and you think he's gone and then he shows up in the game and you haven't planned on how you're going to deal with him, mm -hmm. you know, lights out, you know, it, it can be over just like that. Yeah. So, there, you know, there's a lot of benefit to doing that for teams. Um, now, the NFL, if you get caught doing that, over and over again, okay, where it becomes, you know, the NFL is like, hey, this isn't just a one-time thing. The guy miraculously healed in time. <laughs> you know, there, there is going to be a punishment. So teams have to be a little selective, okay. okay? Can they exaggerate a little bit on a routine basis? Yes. But to do a gross exaggeration becomes difficult. And not that teams aren't willing to do it, not that they're not going to do it, but you have to pick and choose when you're going to do that. Yeah. And for it to be for it to be worthwhile. Absolutely. We've talked a lot about individual players here, um, but I think something that's really useful to coaches to know how to defend or how to attack is knowing the other team's plays. And you mentioned, you know, finding out their signals and, and we'll talk about Spygate specifically in a few minutes. But I'm thinking how incredibly valuable the playbooks themselves are, right? The the, the literal books that teams develop so the players can study all the variations and all the moves so that they know what they're supposed to do in this well-choreographed movement. Um, at a certain point, getting another team's playbook becomes actual theft. It becomes an actual crime under the law, not just a dirty trick. And yet through all of NFL history, you've documented that teams take great efforts to sometimes outright steal other teams' playbooks, uh, but more often to acquire them by uh, uncomfortable, unethical means, but things that probably don't violate the law, like you know, hiring a hiring a player or a coach from another team and encouraging them to tell the the team they're leaving that they lost the playbook, and maybe they have a fine to pay, but it's well worth it to them to come to the team and carry that playbook. Talk through that a little bit, um, how playbooks have evolved and how knowing another team's full set of planned plays, both on offense and defense, basically, they don't give the game away, but it comes pretty close to determining a lot of outcomes. Yeah. So, you know, that that subject, it's a really interesting uh, ethical study or, or, you know, a great study if you're, you know, interested in intellectual property. Um because what you've got is you have all these teams, which are more or less branches of a company, the company being the NFL. So when you're dealing with intellectual property theft of these playbooks, which is essentially what it is, okay? Okay, so you have essentially McDonald's branch stealing from another McDonald's branch. Is that, is that theft? I had not thought of it that way. Right? It brings a lot of legal questions, hmm. a lot of ethical questions into play there. So, you know, the NFL, by and large, um, resolves all of this stuff on its own. And uh, teams are required to go through the NFL for adjudication whenever they have these types of issues uh, because, one, um, anything that could portray them in a bad light, the NFL would like to keep under wraps. And then two, it is essentially an internal matter, right? Because it's a, it's a, um, it's a company, it's a issue within their own company. So it gets really, you know, difficult to say, um, what is breaking laws? Um, and then when you get down to ethics, it becomes very hard because, I think when you get into ethics, the question is not as much what is legal, what is not legal. It is what is a commonly accepted practice. Okay. And, that, and that's hard to nail down because some teams are going to say stealing playbooks is just part of the game. That's the way it is, period. And whether or not it violates a NFL rule or policy, mm -hmm. it's just part of the game. Part of that culture so, of whatever it takes to win is, is a pretty it. strong motivator. 
you know, and of course, David, you know, with your background, right? You know, for international espionage, okay, espionage breaks the yeah, law. Breaking the law of other, breaking the laws of other countries is part of the game, right? Precisely, it's yeah. part of the game, and so. You know, football coaches, a lot of them would argue this is just part of the game and that's what it is. Yeah. And others are going to say, no, it's not. I'm, you know, we play, we need to play by the rules and that's how it should be. So you get a guy like Belichick or a Weeb Eubank or a Al Davis mm-hmm. that is willing to go beyond this. And it becomes, you know, it's really hard. They can be, be labeled as, as, as a bad guy um, and get this image. But it's a, you know, it's not a black and white situation. The NFL coaching and collecting on their teams, it is a world of gray and very often dark gray, uh, just like it is in the international espionage business. And it's, you know, there's going to be a variety of opinions out there. And the NFL's interpretation of these things is just not the end all and be all. And certainly the line goes way past where most fans are willing to draw that line. You know, most fans, if they hear what's going on, they're going to say, oh, they're a bunch of cheaters. Right. Well, the reality is then a bunch of teams are a lot of cheaters. And the coaches of those teams that you're a fan of are much more comfortable with the stuff that goes on than the average fan. Yeah. And it, it is interesting because the more I think about it, I mean, all sports involve deception, right? You... You pretend you're going to pass, and then instead you shoot the basketball. That's that's deception, but it's a completely normal part of the game. in In football, you know, you do a pump fake, right, and you try to try to get the secondary to buy off on a, on a throw that you're not going to make. That that part of deception is not only acceptable; it's expected. You're you're going to do that. Um, some people start to get uncomfortable with the players who clearly went out of bounds. And then pretend they didn't, and they say, "Oh, come on, you know, referees." It's it's to the extent of like flopping in soccer, right? It, it, it goes right. to an extreme sometimes, and people wonder, well, shouldn't they be penalized for even trying to do something so blatantly stupid? But generally, that's also accepted, right? That's just part of the game to pretend that you caught the ball when it's pretty clear to you that it touched the ground as as you were catching it. Um, then there's the stuff that's a little bit trickier, right? Like you know, deception through, you know, certain uh, play calls or drafts, the things we've talked about so far. But then there are some things that get to actual active measures, actual covert action that have been accused in in the past. and, And I think that that are actually true. One example is the headset tampering, right? That their headsets used now, you know, obviously not an issue mm-hmm. 75 years ago in the original teams of the league. But now you've got, you know, the coach talking to the quarterback up to, what is it, 15 seconds before the, the snap. And you've got the defense now able to talk to the, usually the linebacker. Um, but the home team certainly has an incentive to try to disrupt that communication, at least at some point during a high stakes game. That feels different than pretending that you had possession of the ball and hoping that the the replay agrees with you. That feels like you're actually doing something that is well outside the norm of the game. How common do you think things like headset tampering and other active measures, leave aside ball inflation for now, we'll get there, but active measures like that, is that generally part of the game and we just don't see it? Or do we not see it because it's probably so rare? Yeah, it's a re- that's a very, very tough question to answer. So what I will say is that, you know, anybody who's, you know, been involved in the espionage business is well aware of that for every time a, an espionage incident is known, right, there's going to be at least nine or ten more of those that go on undetected. Okay. So having said that, okay, so we, you know, recently, you know, we've caught the Patriots and Spygate and Deflategate. Does that mean that the Patriots are the only ones involved and the only ones doing this type of stuff? Hmm. I would say absolutely not. You know, there's, and Spies on the Sidelines, what I do know is we've got, we've got, you know, quite a few coaches that we absolutely know are willing to go past the lines that most coaches are willing to, 
to go. Does that, does that mean that there are not five times, six times, ten times more of those guys in the NFL's history yeah. out there? I would be surprised if there are, are not. Okay, I think that is absolutely the case. We just don't know about it. Having said that, obviously there becomes there 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 is a line that most coaches are not willing to cross, and headset tampering is one of those. Mm -hmm. You know, so but even there it becomes controversial, and you're never really quite sure. So this is something that the Patriots under Bill Belichick have been accused of doing. Let's go ahead and go there, Kevin, because okay. I mean. When most people think of NFL and espionage or spying or just dirty tricks, two things come to mind, even if they don't know the details. I'm, I'm betting. One is what we call Spygate, and that's what it came to be known as, which I think there are many people who don't know the details of that. And then the deflate gate, the issue with uh, Tom Brady and the, the football. So let's talk briefly about each of those. Walk through on Spygate, which I think we're coming up on, what, the 15th anniversary? of that, but it's, it was the opening right. game of the year, right? Back in 2007. Yeah. So, so September 9th, Spygate was, took place, um, all the way. It's a term for the Patriots recording opponents, uh, signals all the way from the preseason of 2000 to the opening game of the 2006 season. And so what the Patriots were doing was, trying to match up the plays that were ran on the field with the signals that were that typically the defensive coordinator was sending in um, to call how did he want um, his defense to set up you know what's there how many people are going to be in the secondary are they going to blitz how many people are going to be on the front line all of that type of information um, and they were very, very, Patriots were very good at collecting this information um, over, over that length of time. And it gave them a big advantage. Um, there were points that the Patriots actually knew every single defensive play call during a game that the other team ran. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's a huge, huge advantage. Um, so eventually the Patriots got caught. Um, doing this. So in 2005, uh, a number of teams, um, the Packers, and there was another team as well, they brought it up to the NFL um, officially and reported the, that, hey, they're recording our signals. We think this is a bunch of garbage and we want you, the NFL, to take action. And as a result of this, the NFL um, had two memos sent out saying that that practice is not allowed, okay? There is no official rule that says the taping of, of signals is not allowed. It was simply a memo. It became known as the Ray Anderson memo. Um, and But the Patriots decided to ignore that and continued to do it anyway. And then they got in trouble with that. Uh, the, the Jets, um, under Coach Eric Mangini, who was previously the defensive coordinator for the Pats, um, when they... They, they ended up, the Jets under Mangini ended up catching the Patriots and one of their videographers doing this during the first game of the 2006 season. As a result of this, the information, uh, the NFL commissioner ended up calling Bill Belichick and saying, hey, is this true? Did this go on? And Belichick said, yes. And the NFL commissioner said, okay, well, here's your punishment. Um, before an investigation was even launched. Right. Um, right. And that sat really poorly with a lot of people because um, one, no one really, the NFL at that point didn't really know the extent of what had happened. And two, um, the Patriots had been suspected of a lot of different things um, since Belichick had taken over as coach. And Yeah, that's right. This was not this was not a happening in a vacuum. There had been plenty of accusations, but none of which could be proven to a level that the league had to take action. And, and this was different. Yeah, it certainly was. So, um, you know, teams wanted a lot more, um, a, a much bigger investigation. What ultimately ended up happening was the NFL sent uh, two individuals down to, uh, to Foxborough, and they found, I believe it was six tapes 
that were turned over to them. They've been taping, they taped some 40 games. Okay. They've been doing this for since 2000. Okay. So, you know, does anyone really believe they only had six tapes? Okay. They had a whole basically concealed library um, where they kept all of this material, notes, videotapes, et cetera, et cetera. So that didn't sit well with a lot of people. So after the investigation was done and after the punishment was handed down, which ended up being, I think it was a $500,000 fine for Belichick, $250,000 for the Patriots, and they lost a first round draft pick. Which isn't, that isn't nothing. But if they actually won some games or had an advantage in some games because of it, you can understand why others around the league are saying, that's a kind of, it's a big slap on the wrist. It's a, it's a, it's a stab in the wrist, right. but it doesn't, it doesn't take away the very lucrative championships. No, it doesn't. So that's the problem. You know, if you look at how many championships they're winning during that time period, you know, the question is, is the, is the punishment going to deter the crime? And yeah. I think what we have ultimately seen with the Patriots over the course of history with Spygate and Deflategate yeah. um, and moving on from there, other activities as well, is that the punishment has never been severe enough right. to deter them from taking those actions. And, you know, it's just, I don't look at it as anything else. You know, it's like a holding penalty, okay? Is a 10-yard penalty enough to make a player stop holding? Maybe not the first time, but the second time and the third time, eventually, right, um, it's going to kick in. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's a question that the NFL has to ask themselves. You know, they can stop pretty much all of this activity, spying activity that they want through punishments if they make it severe enough. It's just a matter of do they want to make it severe enough um, for it to happen? Yeah. And, yeah. you know, there's a lot of pros and cons there. That's a, that's a tough question to answer. And I think the the link you you, you cited is interesting that you had this scandal and clearly, to almost every observer, clearly the the Patriots and Belichick had had crossed a line. But if if it wasn't enough of a deterrent effect, then is it any surprise that Deflategate happened? Now, whether that was Belichick's involvement, um, it was judged that Brady was almost certainly aware of what was happening. He would know the difference in the the pressure of the ball, and statistically, it'd be really unlikely under natural conditions that the Patriots' balls would all be deflated more than the other team's balls, which were in the same meteorological conditions, right? Um, so clearly something happened there. But should anybody have been surprised that that happened when there hadn't been a stiff penalty for what it took to win a championship before that? Yeah, I would say, you know, obviously um, Patriots are going to do what they feel they need to do to win. Yeah. Um, that's, you know, that's not a big surprise. Um I think what was so interesting there was, um, you know, just the level of of trickery that went went on behind it. You know, and the same thing we saw with Spygate was that it's not just they're doing this, okay? But you know, during Spygate, the Patriots head videographer Jimmy D, he was taking steps on training the videographers on how do we not get caught, okay? What do you what do you wear? How do you cover up your Patriots logo? You know, how do you, you know, don't say that you're with, you know, the Patriots. Uh, say you're with Craft Productions for filming. You know, cover up this stuff. Tape over the red light that shows up when you're actually filming with your video recorder so that it's hidden. You know, this level of trickery. And so we saw that again in Deflategate. It's not just a matter of deflating the ball. It's all the steps that are taken to hide what is going on. So... And Deflategate, what we have was a individual who turns over the balls to a to a referee, um, and then the um, you know which is typical. You're supposed to do this in a game. All t you know, both teams hand over some balls to use. Um, the referee checks them. Typically, make sure that they're at the right pounds per square inch. They're properly inflated. Right. Uh, Twelve point five psi is the minimum level. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, anyone who's ever played football knows that having a smaller football, you know, uh, less inflated yeah. is, is very advantageous um, because it allows you to uh, get your hands around that ball 
better and to be able to to toss it further and to get get a better grip on the ball, of course. Right. Um, so what what ended up happening is um, the Patriots ball boy he collected after turning in the balls to the referee. He takes them back out of the locker room. Okay, and the referee who's responsible, um, Walt Anderson, for maintaining those balls has no idea where they've gone. Eventually, he learns, oh, they're out on the field. And since this is the AFC championship game, he's probably just very relieved to find that, oh, I didn't lose the game balls. Thank goodness, right? They were unaccounted for for a short period of time. And they were, uh, they were. clearly something happened. They were. So, and the Colts had brought up before this game with the NFL that we think the Patriots are deflating balls. And so Walt Anderson, he actually measured these before the game, said they're good. But during the game, the Colts brought the referees of football and said, hey, we don't think this is properly inflated. You guys need to check this one. So during halftime, the NFL had those balls rechecked. And lo and behold, they were well below below the 12.5 PSI range. Uh, The average balls were at 11.3, and one was as low as 10.5, okay? So after the game, the the refs, during the game, they just properly inflate the balls. The Patriots go on to kick uh, the Colts' butt during the game, and the game's over. But after the game, uh, Jim McNally, who's the locker room attendant for the Patriots, who turned over the balls, NFL security interviews them and says, hey, did you take the balls out? And Jim McNally admits, yes, I did, but I just brought them straight to the field. Well, an investigation takes place. And the NFL learns that, lo and behold, Jim McNally stopped in a bathroom for 90 seconds before heading out onto the field. And then um, an investigation goes, the NFL hires a company exponent and a lawyer, uh, Theodore Wells, to look into the matter. And so they look in one, can the balls deflate enough during the game to have naturally caused this without them being, you know, artificially deflated? And, um, and two, can you deflate the balls in 90 seconds? And eventually they say, yeah, you know, they're not going to deflate on their own. And two, yes, you can deflate all these balls within 90 seconds. Yep. Um, yep. And then furthermore, they find a bunch of texts. Yeah, the texts uh, that were the damning one. Yeah. And as, as I remember, it was pretty clear conversations about what Tom wanted and getting mm-hmm. things from Tom for doing this. And you put it all together and it's maybe it doesn't hold up in a court of law as beyond a reasonable doubt, but it comes pretty damn close. Yeah, the whole write up about def- deflate gate was, you know, essentially said that it is more probable than not that um, that Jim McNally deflated these footballs and that too, uh, Tom Brady had knowledge of what was going on as well. Um, yeah, and the texts are very damning. And, you know, and Tom Brady didn't even turn over his, his phone to the NFL and he said he destroyed it for security reasons. <laughs> Who destroys their phone? I mean... You know, maybe Intel guys destroying phones on a regular basis isn't that weird, but I would say for most people, um, you know, that that's a pretty strange thing to be doing. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Um, yeah. and so he said, you know, I can't show these texts. Uh, so right. yeah, it didn't it didn't it didn't look good for him. You know, the case went all the way to a you know U.S. appeals court, which yeah. was ridiculous. Almost went to the Supreme Court which would have been, you know, like we have no bigger issues other than are some footballs deflated. Um, right. But Tom Brady just wasn't willing to let it go and to have his image mm-hmm. tarnished. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it, it went pretty far. But the bottom line is at every step, um, pretty much everybody said, yeah, Patriots, it looks like you're guilty here. Well, you know, all of these stories are just fascinating as windows into the the overlap, really, between the world of intelligence and espionage and in the NFL as it actually operates. And I'm, I'm glad you shared them with us. And now we're going to reach into the chatterbox to ask you one final question. It's always uncomfortable because I don't know what it's going to be. <laughs> uh, what book is on your nightstand or what book or Kindle or audio book um, do you have coming up? I'm trying to remember the name of it. Uh, I just read the follow-up to The Martian. 
Um, oh yeah, uh, Andrew Weir, Andy Weir. Yes, yeah. Which was which was a which was a really good book. Um, I don't know if it's quite as good as The Martian, but it was it was still a great read. Love that book. Um, other than that, you know, I do a lot of reading in in French, and I try to keep it uh, at the level that I can actually read it. So <laughs> um, I'm reading Twilight and Harry Potter. Oh, and wow. French because that, you know, that teenage level How about that? Uh, is about right. And I try to read books that I've read before in, in English mm. uh, before I read them in French. So um, pick, up, pick up on that's, it. Yeah. that's what I'm currently um, working away at. But, you know, I, honestly, uh, David, they, I'm so bogged down in reading football books for, <laughs> you know, I did it, obviously the research for this one. My next mm. book is on the same subject, uh, spying in college football. Oh, so I'm wow. in the midst of plenty of material uh, there, right? Oof. Doing the research for that book as well. So well, my life is just one football book after another. I gotta right say, we, we look forward to it. Thank you for writing spies on the sidelines about the NFL. And thank you for joining me on chatter. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. You bet. That was Chatter, a production of Lawfare and Goat Rodeo. Please subscribe to the podcast and find us on Twitter at That Was Chatter. Chatter.